talk to you about um, technology and specifically in the realm of agriculture and how it has impacted wildlife. So we're really going to shift focus a bit. We're not going to be talking about the, the technology itself, but the impact of the technology. And I'm going to introduce, start out by talking a bit about the research that we are doing on bioenergy development. So the development of biomass feedstocks for energy, but I will interpret that and discuss it in the context of historical patterns in agriculture in Illinois. And so, um, start out here, you know, I got interested in, in sustainable energy and specifically sustainable agriculture when I arrived at Eastern Illinois University. So I was sort of brought into the fold, sort of got caught up in Eastern's initiative to be green, to be sustainable. And as all of you know, anybody here who's at Eastern, we have a brand new renewable energy center. Right now it um, is working with state-of-the-art gasif gasifiers, so it converts biomass energy into gas, which can then be burned to produce um, steam to heat the buildings and to provide at least, you know, I think the estimates are up to about 10% of electricity on campus. Right now, again, we we're using wood chips. Wood chips, if you look around Illinois, we are not a forested state, we're not a forested landscape. So we end up bringing in the biomass from pretty far away. Not a really sustainable solution because we've got a pretty big carbon footprint in terms of all of the petroleum that we're using to fuel the transportation of that bioenergy, um, that, that biomass feedstock. What we are looking for right now, okay, until we can actually start burning something other than, than wood chips, we are in need of a sustainable local biomass feedstock. Now, not sure how many of you are familiar with Illinois history, but Illinois is primarily an, a prairie state, okay? So if we could go back and transport ourselves back in time into the early 1800s, we had some forest in southern Illinois, but it's mostly prairie. So when we're thinking about a local bioenergy feedstock, what ultimately comes to mind, or what I should say immediately comes to mind, are some of these perennial grasses, some of these tall grasses. Now, Dr. Tom Canham, who is a colleague of mine and a collaborator, he's investigating the potential um, use of hybrid poplar, or fast growing wood, um, woody tree species. Um, but we're also looking at some of these bio, um, these dedicated bioenergy crops, okay? So crops that are used solely for bioenergy production, something like miscanthus. Now miscanthus is a perennial grass, okay? So it has that in common with a lot of native grasses, but it is not native to Illinois. It is introduced. It is a hybrid, um, and it is a hybrid from two species that are from Asia. Now, switchgrass is another potential. A lot of people like switchgrass because switchgrass is also perennial grass, but it's native, okay? So it has lots of benefits. So just a really brief background, Miscanthus, as I mentioned, it's a hybrid between two species, two Asian species. Um, it is considered to be sterile, so it can produce seeds, but they're not viable, so they don't turn into anything. Um, they're, they're not... Um, if you find them in the environment, there's not a lot of fear, at least right now, that they're going to turn into anything, um, at least from the perspective of the folks that are growing this. There are, is a lot of concern on the part of ecologists, natural resource managers, that um, maybe some of those seeds, if viable, can actually you know, lead to problems if it ends up being invasive. They grow through their rhizomes, through their roots, so there's also concern that they could be invasive through their root system. So even though it says sterile, um, we think it's sterile, okay? Um, we're still doing a lot of research on that. Um, Miscanthus has gotten a lot of attention because it has a lot of benefits. We know it grows well in Illinois, it's a perennial grass. Illinois has a climate um, that is very well suited for growing perennial grasses like Miscanthus. It grows very quickly. So at the beginning of the year, it is really short, you know, in, in April, May, and it can grow to be about three, three and a half meters by July. Okay, so it puts on a lot of biomass quickly.
quickly. In terms of bioenergy crops, that's a great characteristic, right? You don't want something that's sparsely vegetated. You want a lot of biomass. Um, it's great for farmers as well. Okay, because obviously if you're going to look for a bioenergy crop, you want something that's going to give you a high yield. The other thing about miscanthus that farmers like it's that, is that it's versatile. It can be burned directly to produce heat. It can be burned in the gasification process, so you can use it to you burn it to produce gas, which then you can use in different ways. You can also use it as bedding. There you can convert it to ethanol. So for producers, in very volatile markets when things are sort of uncertain, this gives them some comfort because if they're not using it for one output, they're using it for another. Um, as I said, it has lots of benefits in terms of the energy it can produce. Um, you know, the farmers are thinking about its, its um, profitability. There's still a lot we don't know about miscanthus though. Um, and that's primarily in the realm of wildlife biodiversity. We still don't know what the impacts of miscanthus are on wildlife. All of the studies that have been done and published today that we, we're aware of have been done in Europe. Wildlife here, wildlife in Europe, it's not the same. Um, while we can gain some insight as to what the potential impacts may be, we really need to start understanding this right now in our system. Um, we're seeing it on the landscape. A few farmers, um, I can think of maybe, you know, a handful of farmers locally who have put some pilot fields on their farms. They're exploring it because if a market develops, if Eastern, for example, decides that they can burn miscanthus, now there's a market for it. Um, and so local farmers want to be ready and they want to be able to produce this and possibly sell it to Eastern or to sell it to other nearby um, bioenergy facilities that may come online in the in the near future. So they're sort of getting primed for it, but it hasn't gone full scale yet. So we want to understand what the impacts are now so we can work with the producers to guide the, the production and harvesting of these crops so that it's beneficial for wildlife. We're also interested in ecosystem services, and this is something some of my other colleagues are, are working on. Um, they are looking at water quality with these bioenergy crops and also looking at, you know, ash, what is burned in the renewable energy center, um, what comes out of it, if it can be put on fields, and they're, they're looking at the, those um, different aspects of the system. So just always like to, to remind us that when we're thinking of sustainability, that it is very multifaceted, okay? We often think, again, in terms of profitability for the producers, we think of how much energy we can get out of the crops, how much biomass, so the yield. Sometimes we're thinking about maybe water quality, but for something to be sustainable, okay, you have to have all of these needs met. So really what we're looking at, um, we're going to face trade-offs Okay, we're not going to be able to maximize profitability um, for producers, maximize biodiversity and accomplish all of it. So what we like to see is that we're considering the environmental components, social components and economic components. And where they intersect, that is the domain of sustainability. Okay, so we need something that can simultaneously accomplish all of these goals wildlife diversity oftentimes gets overlooked and it's really key um, wildlife provide important ecosystem services if we're thinking about plants they're very important in an agricultural landscape to filter out um, pesticides and herbicides that are applied to the farms um, we have some animals that are that are useful in keeping pests down things like bats for example we have pollinators so we need to keep wildlife on the landscape what I have been doing with a team of colleagues in the Department of Biological Sciences and also some students that are in my lab, both undergraduate and graduate students at Eastern, is we're trying to understand the impacts of miscanthus on wildlife. And we're focusing on miscanthus again because that's what farmers have been exploring. And I will emphasize that our team is not advocating the production of any um, particular bioenergy source because we still don't know what the, the impacts are, the pros and the cons of any of those. What our research is doing is simply trying to take a neutral approach, an objective approach to go out there and try to quantify what the responses are, positive and negative, trying to work with farmers to see how we can implement, how we can deploy these crops in a sustainable fashion. Um, 
So what we've done is we've gone out to these farms. There are four farms in Champaign and Douglas counties um, where farmers have already, for one reason or, or another, they've decided to put miscanthus on their fields. And we have looked at birds and small mammals and we've been comparing the number of species and the abundance of animals in miscanthus and comparing it to traditional row crops, hay and grasslands, just to see what the impact may be if we decide to go full scale. These data are really preliminary, so I'm really not going to provide much in the way of data, um, just sort of give you a little hint of what we found based on you know a year or so of data. We've got a lot more work to do, but I want to acknowledge um, Melissa Hutmaker was an undergraduate student. She was interested in pheasants. She um, is a hunter herself, uh, so wildlife is really important to her. So she was looking at ring neck pheasants. Um, Jennifer Alberts is a graduate student looking at small mammal communities and Matthew Craffey is looking at songbird communities. And this is just one of the sites and any one of the landscapes has a mixture of different land cover types. So I'll just give you some sort of take home points. Pheasants and other wildlife like to use, this is the miscanthus in the fall. One thing that distinguishes it from traditional row crops like corn um, or, or other crops like um, soybeans is that the crop will stay on the ground throughout the winter. It's not harvested until maybe February or March, depending on the conditions. This is great. If you're a pheasant or you're a coyote, all of the corn and soy is off the field. It's barren out there. The only thing you've got are some grasslands, um, which tend to not be as tall. And you've got this miscanthus. Well, sure enough things go in there to seek cover when it's really cold out there so we've got rabbits these are from trail cameras and they don't show up very well here but trust me you can have to take my word for it we've got lots of rabbits going in and out of the miscanthus this is miscanthus here um, this is a farmer's house here we've got tons of rabbits coyotes raccoons um, and pheasants which was what melissa was looking for well the pheasants also use the grasslands in the winter and it turns out that those grasslands are extremely important. And, and when we're talking about grasslands, we're talking about these really long, narrow grasslands, you know, that are around the edges of the fields or along the edges of streams. Um, areas that farmers um, can't really put corn in there or other crops because it's not very good soil. Um, and we're worried about water quality. So we put the grasslands there sort of to filter out um, chemicals as they go before they go into the waterway. And when you cut this, all of those pheasants all go into the grasslands. Um, so this highlights the importance of maintaining those grassy areas on the landscape. The reason I say that and the reason I, I just emphasize how important it is, is because a lot of these linear grasslands, and I'm just going to back up for a second. Um, see this green area? These are the grasslands in this system. It's, they're really long and narrow. They're not very abundant. This is the miscanthus here. When we cut the miscanthus in the winter, all of the pheasants that were in here end up going here. Those grasslands are what some farmers are looking to replace with miscanthus. If we take them out of the landscape, when we cut the miscanthus in the winter, where does the wildlife go? They won't really have that refuge anymore. So that's a real um, important lesson that we've learned um, and that we're talking to a lot of farmers about it. Um, the importance of maintaining those because again like i said that's marginal land miscanthus grows really well on marginal soils so it's not good for corn it's not good for soy but miscanthus does really well there and so they're this sort of a dangerous position to be in um, because that's the most important for the wildlife um, turns out that with songbirds and small mammals both the diversity and the abundance are lower in miscanthus than they are in these native vegetation types, so shrublands, forests, and, and CRP is conser res Conservation Reserve Program Grasslands. Um, this is set aside land, these are the grasslands. Um, so we've got the grasslands, shrublands, and forest. Diversity is much higher in these natural systems, of course. Um, and what we see here is this is the miscanthus in different stages of development, and these are traditional agricultural types. So, at least during the breeding season, they don't look, for birds and small mammals, don't look like they're much worse than traditional crops. Um, but they're much, they're not really that great when we compare them to native or semi-native um, vegetation types. What we found is that if we increase um, the number of different land cover types, 
on the landscape. So we have a little bit of miscanthus, a little bit of, you know, we maintain those grassy areas, even if they're long and narrow and not very abundant. Um, we can maintain some shrub components in the landscape. We can increase our diversity. Um, again, I emphasize that these are really preliminary. So I wanted to put this all in context. So this is what we've, this is what we're faced with today. And I, I get a lot of um, concerns, you know, we are running out of fossil fuels. The bottom line is we're running out of them. We need to find an alternative. Biomass feedstocks, bioenergy is going to be one part of the solution, you know, along with wind and solar and other, um, you know, renewable energy sources. Okay, so we need to start thinking about bioenergy. We can't just say don't do it because it's, you know, bad for the birds and bad for the mammals. What we need to be figuring out is how can we do it? How can we do it in a way that we maintain, we don't lose anything else? Um, maybe even bring some things back. Um, I think there are some options out there. We don't know what they are yet. Again, we've just started, um, but we're working with landowners um, to think, to figure out what might be possible. Also, it's not just miscanthus. One of the um, aspects of bioenergy that our department is really interested in is the use of native perennial grasses. So we're working with some folks, we're working with the Lumpkin family um, locally, um, the Department of Biological Sciences, to look at some perennial um, grasses and look at their potential for bioenergy. But I wanted to think about, you know, to put this in the context of, um, you know, we're going to be introducing you know, I don't know what the bioenergy crop is. It's probably going to be multiple crops. I don't know how much, I don't know where it's going to be in Illinois, but I think it's pretty safe to say we're going to see bioenergy crops. Um, so let's think about this sort of in the context of Illinois. Um, you know, like, yeah, a lot of people are complaining about bioenergy crops and they can be, you know, they do have a lot of downsides. Again, you know, invasiveness, at least some bioenergy crops. But think about Illinois. Illinois has undergone a lot of changes in agriculture, okay? So, and we look around and corn and soy, they're not native to Illinois either, right? Um, and we've had a lot of changes in the landscape. So I wanted to consider these in the context of what we know um, and lessons learned. What can we say about what we've done in Illinois over the last you know, 200 years almost and learn from those lessons so that when we're developing bioenergy crops in Illinois, how can we avoid making the same mistakes we've made in the past? So. Just to you know, give you some insight, this is um, a photograph from the early 1900s. Okay, this is the way we used to do farming in Illinois. Actually, even you know, in the 1850s, it was even you know less technology than this. You know, now you we got you know it's probably a little fancier even by the 1900s. Um, we go into 1950s. We've got bigger tractors. We've got bigger fields. They're cleaner fields. Um, this is today. This is our landscape today. It's big fields, very uniform. We've lost all the, you know, the, the trees around the edges, the little edges of the grass. Um, we're using massive machinery, lots of inputs in terms of water, fertilizers, pesticides. We've got transgenic crops um, or genetically modified crops on there now. It's, it's a whole nother landscape. So change in agriculture is not new to Illinois, okay? We've been changing for the last couple hundred years. So the question is, how should we change? Um, and what have these changes done in terms of the wildlife? What impact have they had? Well, here's just another summary of sort of what I've showed you. Um, this blue line shows um, how farms with horses and mules have declined <laughs> since the 1900s, not surprising. And at the same time, we see an increase in the number of farms with tractors and the amount of fertilizer um, that's put on farms. So, you know, technology, you know, at work here, um, making our lives easier, right? More convenience for humans. And we've obviously got um, more um, yield, higher yields. So what impact has that had? Well. I was fortunate enough to do a postdoc at the Illinois Natural History Survey. And in, 19, in the early 1900s, um, Forbes, Stephen J. Forbes, was sort of really insightful. He said, we're gonna go out and do these bird surveys across the entire state of Illinois. Um, and so he has sent a team out to, you know, they walked these really long transects, wrote down all the birds they, they heard and saw. And then in the 1950s, um, Dick and Jean Graber said, you know, we're going to redo this survey. We're going to try to go back to the same places, do the same surveys, see what we get. And then in 2008, um, 
Jeff Walk, Mike Ward, and some folks from the Illinois Natural History Survey said, we're going to do it again. And DNR funded the work for them to go and do the surveys a third time. So we have data on birds for 100 years. We also have information on how the landscape has changed. What's happened in terms of the landscape change? Well, we've seen that a lot of birds have declined. Most birds have declined, I would venture to say. Some have disappeared, something like this upland sandpiper. It, you'd be hard pressed to find one in Illinois today. Um, some are hanging on, some are doing quite well, like red-winged blackbirds, killdeer, um, horned larks. They love agricultural fields, so this is actually good for them. Um, so we see these decreases. Um, more technology, more intensive agriculture, um, larger changes. I just want to also give you, I love these photographs because a photograph can really tell you a lot more than, than I could tell you by trying to explain this to you. But this is a cornfield in the 1900s. You notice that there are hedgerows here. It's sort of messy. <laughs> it would, this would sort of probably bring tears to a producer's eyes today. It's really messy. This is what our cornfields look like today. They're very clean. They're very homogeneous. Um, this is an orchard in the early 1900s. This is an orchard today. It's much cleaner. That heterogeneity is actually really beneficial for a lot of birds. And it turns out that if we look back to the 1900s, the data that they were collecting when the fields looked like this, we had lots of species, species that are really important today and of concern actually occupied agricultural landscapes. So it's not like agriculture and biodiversity are at odds. We can do both but it has to be done in the proper way. And so um, what we've seen with the, the changes in agriculture, we've lost a lot of these really important bird species. Um, just to give you an idea, by homogenizing the landscape, we've got fewer crop types on the landscape. The fields are larger and cleaner, more homogenous. We've also homogenized our bird community. So we've got four species here that make up the majority of of the individuals on the landscape. We're losing the, the diversity. 60% um, of the species compromise less than 0.1% of total birds. A lot of rare species out there. We've seen similarities with mammals. Okay, so with the start of agriculture, we lost a lot of mammals um, by draining prairies um, and diversity, you know, changing the way we, we do agriculture. We've pretty much sort of done them in. Um, some have come back though and done well. Um, we took out the wolf, which helped the deer a whole lot. Um, so we see these changes. It's not just, just birds. So what's next? You know, as I mentioned, I, I don't think we can just say we're, we're not going to use bioenergy crops. We're going to ignore them. We're going to use them. Um, we have to. We have to, you know, get off um, our, we have to change our reliance, reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. But how do we do it? Um, and that's sort of where our part comes in. We're working with the producers, we're working with folks in technology, we're working with, you know, we'd like to work with some economists to look at the, you know, you know, how the, the dollars and cents work out. But we want to try to look at all aspects of this issue. We want to, for Eastern's perspective, um, and to really sort of, you know, back up this, this you know, saying that we, we are sustainable, we want to be sustainable, um, then we need to find the most sustainable biomass feedstock for the Renewable Energy Center. And like I said, we really need to take into account all of these components. I think we can learn from the past, how we've seen things change in Illinois. Um, really large fields that are very uniform are not very beneficial for wildlife species. We need some heterogeneity. That means keeping grasslands on the landscape, which is really important with recent changes with the Farm Bill, we need to keep those grasslands on the landscape. Um, I can't emphasize that enough because that's the first place farmers are looking to, to, to plant some of these crops. Um, so let's look and see what worked well. Farm Bill, some of these set aside programs worked really well. Monocultures, not so well. Taking out the hedgerows, not so well. We need to cooperate with the producers, okay? We can't expect that, that the producers are going to um, produce crops or fields that have lots of patches in them that don't have a really good yield. We can't expect them to, to do that. Um, it's economically not profitable for them. So we need to start thinking about subsidies um, for them. Um, and so this is sort of where we'll leave it. We're sort of writing the next chapter. We don't know what's gonna happen, but I think the important part is that we're, we're at a time when we can look at the potential impacts and we can hopefully shape the direction of bioenergy development in this region um, in a positive way. So um, 
with that, I'll just acknowledge a whole bunch of people who have helped out. Um, you know, some people here at Eastern who are involved with the bioenergy work, um, some other collaborators of mine, Jeff Walk from the Nature Conservancy, Mike Ward, TJ Benson, and Jeff Braun. They're up uh, at the University of Illinois, and they were involved with the, the historical um, study. And again, lots of producers and funding sources. So thank you. I'll take any questions if you have any. Thank you very much. I have a question regarding the response of the uh, producer. You okay. work with producers in the field. Yes. How was the response, basically? You have to Actually, the response has been really positive, but it's, I think it's because we're working with a unique group of producers. So one of the, the producers, Eric Rund, he, he put in the miscanthus and then he came to us and said, you know, I really want to make sure that I'm not going to put something on my field and that later, you know, all the resource managers and all the ecologists are just going to, you know, be up in arms about it. He said, I really want to understand what the impact is going to be on the wildlife. So he's really, you know, sort of a, he's got a very broad view of this. So he came in you know, wanting to understand what the impacts were in every single, from every single angle. Um, and the other farmers that he's working with, um, they, they've got a similar mentality. And so I don't know if that's going to be um, shared by the majority of the farmers. But again, some of the, one of the other farmers we worked with, one of the other producers, um, actually he was a landowner. He wasn't um, so much the producer, but he was a landowner. He was very interested in maintaining the wildlife because he's a hunter. And he uh, actually thought, well, if I put the miscanthus on the field, maybe it's actually going to attract some wildlife. And he would really would have really liked to, to understand what the impacts were on wildlife. So again, this could be a unique subset of producers we're working with, but the ones we've worked with have been highly, you know, um, cooperative, you know, interested in hearing what the, you know, the out you know the outcome of the study is so and again you know just to re-emphasize we're really trying to take a neutral perspective you know they're, they're we're cooperating with the producers but they've planted this and we're just coming in and really taking an objective approach to this we're not trying to advocate any kind of agenda right now um, which we have to be really careful about because it's a very really sensitive topic to a lot of people again because mostly because of the concerns that it's going to be invasive potentially through the the growth of their underground roots so it's it's a tricky topic, but I think um, there are other bioenergy sources out there that can deal with some of those concerns. Do they need to dedicate a certain piece of land for this whole year, whole year or just? Well, actually, it's a really long-term investment because miscanthus, once it's perennial, so once you put it in the ground, each year it will keep coming back. So it can come back. They've been studying it uh, at U of I, and I think they've estimated that up to 20 years. Mm -hmm. So you don't put this in the ground. It's not like corn or soy that each year you plant it. You plant it one, and if it t you plant it once, and if it takes root, you can have that crop on the land for 20 years. So it's a major investment. Yeah, once you once you decide this is going to be miscanthus. It's going to be miscanthus for a while, and we're not sure. Um, some of the research I think is coming out of U of I. They're looking at, you know, if you do plant it, how can you get rid of it if you wanted to get rid of it? And I, I can't remember if that's coming out of U of I or, or another agency, but um, they're thinking about this. They're also thinking about, you know, how far can the roots, you know, drift down water, you know, um, downstream if they get into the stream. Um, thinking about some really bad experiences they've had with uh, other plants like Rivendo Donax, you know, in other areas. Um, so they're, they're looking at it from all different angles, the invasiveness perspective, um, ecosystem services. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>